This is the Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 240 in ARGB and I do not want to waste anybody's time here. So if you've already seen my video on the LF3420, which was six months ago, I believe, feel free to skip to this timestamp to get to a short explanation on something very important about the benchmark section or this one where we just go straight to the benchmarks. And I am not going to say anything new about this AIO that I have not already been saying on the 420 video. So for everybody who is new to this majestic thing and for those of you who enjoy listening to my bassy voice, please consult with your local priest after the video, but uh, let's get to it. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 in, oh, uh, sorry, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 240 exists in three variants, a 240 in all black, a 240 in black with ARGB, which is the one we are benchmarking here today, and a white one full of RG poop. Technically, all of them should perform somewhat the same, but in reality, they, they just won't. The Arctic uh, P12s and P12 ARGBs are not precisely the same fans. The ARGBs are spinning slightly faster and they've got that ring around the impeller, not to forget the performance enhancing ARGB of course. That said, the difference is not big enough to make it worth a full video, really not. So there is going to be a difference, but such a small one that it just won't make it out of the margin of error. And I tried, it, it won't make it out of the margin of error. Now the LF3 is definitely something special. We got the 38 millimeter thick radiator paired with two up to 2000 rpm quick spinning P12 ARGBs which can push up to 48.82 CFM at up to 1.85 millimeters of H2O of static pressure. And compared to the previous generation Liquid Freezer 2, it's not like Arctic just reused the old radiator. They, they came up with new stuff. Like the Gen 3 reds are now one FPI denser at 15 and the fins themselves go deeper into the whole block or in other words, the gap between the shroud where the fan is mounted to and where the fins begin has become smaller. So hence you have like more cooling area. The other major improvement can be found on the block. There we got the new Arctic circle of cooling, which is just a way better description compared to the ugly spaceship that we had before. Anyway, this thing sits on top of the water block pump combo and is supposed to cool down the VRMs around the CPU. This is nothing new. The ugly spaceship had that too. But now it has, or the fan itself has become significantly bigger. Unfortunately, the fact that the whole combo is round doesn't mean that all of the space is occupied by a fan. In reality, the fan is in there and it is much, much smaller and takes up a fraction of the, the entire space. On the other hand, it's like, re the fan is really thick, like that, that's like a 30, 35 millimeter thick fan. Depending on your exact combo, that fan can be more or not so much useful, but it's always going to be better to have that fan than to not have it. And across all Liquid Freezer 3s, that part is just identical. So to take a few pages out of the original LF3 420 review, we benchmarked that fan on our usual Intel benchmark machine using the 320 watts preset and compared to the second gen Liquid Freezer 2, we saw the VRM temps drop by 11.5 instead of 3.9, 6 instead of 2.7 and 13 instead of 5.3 degrees C depending on the VRM sensor we are looking at. And overall, the difference that this somewhat small fan, let's call it sm small, uh, is making is huge. That's not to say that not having that fan will make your PC light on fire, but having it drops one of the sensors by 13 degrees. So yeah, that thing has an impact, a big one. Another special thing about this AIO compared to the alternatives is how you connect everything. First up are the two 450 millimeter long tubes, which are kind of long for a 240 millimeter AIO, mind you, which I appreciate. But hidden inside of these are PWM and three pin ARGB cables. You see, by default, the water block pump combo comes without a connection and included in the box of goodies, we got these two cables. One of them ends with a single four pin PWM plug and if we remove the magnetically attached water block pump combo, yeah, it's uh, super useful that it's just like magnetic. Anyway, if we remove it, we can connect that cable and route the cable properly so that it doesn't get stuck in between. And this single line cable will now go through the water block pump combo 
travel within the tubes all around and then go into the radiator and that provide ARGB and fan power to the P12s. And that way we can control the whole AIO with a single PWM connection and a single 3-pin ARGB connection or just PVM if you got the black edition. And the AIO isn't totally dumb too. If you make the whole thing spin extremely slow, it does not mean that the pump will be close to zero. There's a document showing what I mean. If you use that single combination cable, the pump has a quite high minimum speed setting or at least much higher than for example the P12. And once you crank the settings up, the pump will just max out at about 80% of the PVM settings, whereas the fans will just slowly progress until they reach their max at 100%, which makes sense. Important to note here, it's also not like the pump is limited to that 80%. They just set or, or offset the whole thing so that the pump reaches max faster. But what if you want to control everything individually? That's where this cable comes into play. Instead of controlling everything using a single plug, we now got individual plugs for everything where you can set the speed as you wish. And we do not need to route every cable from every component. The ball on the block combined with the hidden cables and the tubes and whatnot, they do all the work for us. We just need to, to remember which connector goes where and what is written on the connector itself. And the last special thing about these LF3s is how you install them on Intel. Because as you probably know already, Intel screwed up, let's say, their socket mounting to such a degree that Arctic just came in and replaced it. Instead of giving us a regular old backplate and a bunch of screws to get that gorgeous little copper cold plate glued to the chip, we are getting a full contact frame to replace the one that bends to a little bit of social pressure. On AMD it's not like that. There, there is like a bunch of mounting clips and screws. But this does bring me to how we get this thing going. Out of the box, the Liquid Freezer 3 comes with the before mentioned connection possibilities as well as installation hardware for the newest Intel or the newest two Intel sockets as well as AM5 and AM4. Not particularly backwards compatible, but let's be honest, this is a brand new AIO and like super mega high performance, so who installs this on a decade old CPU? To get the cooler going on Intel, we need to place the motherboard onto something that provides some sort of back pressure onto the socket itself and make sure that we got the CPU in there already and keep the socket open. From there, use the provided Allen wrench to remove all four socket screws. And yes, it is normal that this feels kinda warranty destroying. Once that's off, we can replace the top and bottom ILM part and replace it with the provided Arctic contact frame with the arrow in the bottom left corner. From there, use the new screws with the Phillips head and screw them in by using an X pattern only a few turns at a time and continue to do so until each screw is all the way in. If you got any issues to get the screws in, it is possible that the let's say smaller back plate that, that keeps the socket mounting intact has slightly shifted. I installed these AIOs like two dozens of times now and that does happen sometimes. So what I usually do is just lift the motherboard, put my hand underneath and then apply some pressure and look through the holes in the top to uh, somewhat align them. And then, yeah, it's a Philly job, but it's a Philly job. Over on AMD, it's much, much easier. Remove the original retention brackets, replace them with the provided spacers and then add the mounting clips with L and R being readable and screw everything down. From there on both sockets, thermal paste, position the VRM fanless combo onto the chip with the tubes in the bottom, screw it down and reinstall the top cap which will now go all the way in because the screws aren't blocking it anymore. On the whole installation part, a, a few things. First off, having the tubes come out in the bottom is something different. There aren't that many AIOs, though I have seen quite a few come out since the Arctic Liquid Freezer, but there aren't that many around that have this. And it's a design choice, you may like it or not, at least it's absolutely no way to have any sort of RAM interference, so that's nice. But there can be other instances, like for example with M2 heatsinks. In, uh, in one particular instance, we have a uh, Gigabyte AMD motherboard. There I have to remove the heatsink, though nobody is forcing me to, to leave it on there. To be sure if your motherboard is compatible, there is a compatibility checklist on Arctic's website that you can check out. For the Intel installation method with that contact frame, as I said, I did dozens, multiple dozens, and we will get to that, installations of these Arctic Liquid Freezer 3s. And so far, I did not have any issue. Not a single time has the system not posted or was anything was not sitting as flush as it should have been. So everything is okay. 
but I do not really feel particularly comfortable knowing that potential first-time builders are going to remove an Intel ILM and then install a custom one. I feel like that's a bit too much for a first time and including the regular Intel mounting kit that Arctic is now offering separately to make the LF3 compatible with older sockets and the new ones, by the way. It's, it's not like a, a restriction. But that, including that kit, would have been a good idea to do that from the start. That said, let's talk about the fact why I had to install the LF3s for dozens and dozens of times. Sometime after the LF3 for 20 review, Arctic did send over all of the other Liquid Freezer 3s. Then I benchmarked them, and for some reason, some of my smaller ones came dangerously close to that original 420, which did not make a lot of sense. And if the load was high enough, they even surpassed it, which makes even less sense. Then I repeated all of the benchmarks, all three loads with all three, one, two, three, yeah, three new sizes, and uh, no, no changes, nothing outside the margin of error. Right after benchmarking the new ones, I also benchmarked all of them using P12 and P14 maxes. That's because we have videos coming uh, regarding like uh, Arctic maxes. And thankfully during that, I also decided to re-benchmark the LF3 in 420 a few times with the original P14s. And I, I sometimes do re-benchmarks of, of random AIOs and to, just to be sure that everything is still fine, but it was not fine. I benchmarked the 420 five times, six times. I re-benchmarked the whole thing like maybe five, six, seven times. I Every time I reinstalled the whole mounting on Intel and the resulting temperature was just way, way b below what we had when we first benchmarked it. At that point, we had sub 240 ARGB performance out of the 420. And I just couldn't figure out why. All the new LF3s did perform roughly as I expected, and the only outliner was that original LF3 420. And I did rebenchmark the, the new ones, the 240, 280, 360, again and again and again, and they did not jump out of the margin of error. On the other hand, the LF3 420, the original one, it became worse on every f Mm -hmm. on every freaking run that I was doing. Which is now the reason why there is a new Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 for 20 called New Sample. Because as it turns out, my New Sample consistently performed about 2 degrees C better than the first one had. And there I can re-benchmark it and it will not go outside the margin of error, which makes sense. It kind of makes me also doubt if my original 420 wasn't maybe a crappy sample or a halfway broken sample to begin with. It's a possibility, it's a theory that I can never test. I did send it back to Arctic, but I have yet to hear anything about it. But uh, yeah, that's the state. All of that said, I will leave the two LF3 for 20 results in the charts for all of the LF3 reviews. Afterwards, the old one will just disappear because I do not have the physical sample anymore. So please don't tell me in the comments that there are two different results. This is why, that's the full explanation why I have a new sample, why I did not trust the old uh, benchmark results anymore, and yeah, let's finally get to why we are all here. First up is Intel, where we benchmark on a 3900K using three presets, 120, 250, and 320 watts. We start at full blast, after which we slowly lower the fan speed in 10% steps, while it's noting down the noise and performance to create a noise to performance graph. The pump is kept at 100% all the time. At 120 watts, the 240 version of Arctic's new AIO line kept the chip at 30.3 degrees C above ambient, which is fine. It's within margin of error of the Montec Hyperflow 240 and ID Cooling DX240 Max. The only outliner here, and it's still uh, baffling to me, is the Iceberg Thermal AIO. There, the 240mm AIO was just flat out better. But this is an Arctic AIO, and Arctic AIOs are known for their great noise to performance ratios. And there the 240 scored so many points. Both the Montec Hyperflow and ID Cooling do not stand a chance. Sure, they can deliver somewhat comparable temperatures, but once we consider noise, this is another world. That said, the Ice Flow Oasis is still slightly better. But not that much though. To have some alternative comparisons, I also left the uh, new LF3 420 in there. And on the other hand, we got the NHD 15 G2. So we know how the 240 compares to a huge AIO and to an air cooler. Over 250 watts, the new LF3 240 managed to keep the chip at 56.7 degrees C above ambient. This time outperforming both the ID cooling and hyperflow AIOs by a little bit and finally getting closer to that Oasis in 240. 
The corresponding noise to performance graph looks slightly better. The difference to the Montec and ID cooling 240s might still look the same, but now the liquid freezer in 240 actually ends up somewhat similar to the Oasis. The only difference is that the Oasis can keep on going for longer, giving us more performance at the cost of a little bit more noise. Pushing 320 watts to the socket made the CPU rise to 76.7 degrees C above ambient. Here keep in mind that we do allow CPUs to go to 110 degrees C before we stop this test. At this point the ID cooling and Montec AO started to just fall behind, they can't handle that, and the Oasis came into margin of error zone. Interestingly though, pushing enough heat through the AAO does at some point give the LF3 the size advantage. Because over at the noise to performance ratio for 320 watts, the LF3 240 finally managed to beat the Oasis 240, maybe not by a lot, but finally a 240 AAO that can beat that thing. The only thing it took was a ridiculous amount of power. Over on AMD we benchmark on a 7950X3D where we start at 100% fan speed, then we slowly lower the fan speed and note the average core clock across all cores as well as the noise giving us a noise to performance ratio. Here we can immediately see what we saw on the 320 watts results over on Intel. No matter how loud you allow that thing to be, the 420 will always keep the core clock slightly higher, which makes sense. But in order for something like the ID cooling to get to the same core speed average, you need to make it significantly louder. And the same applies for, for example, the Montec AIO or even the NHD15 G2. That said, the 7950X3D doesn't burn a lot of power, so this might change if you're using a non-X3D chip or the newer X3D chips. But for the old one, for the 7950X3D, excellent result. And that pretty much sums up my opinion about the LF3240. It's the excellent result. For a 240mm AIO, that thing is just fantastic. Sure, it's not a 420, let's not lie to ourselves here, I will always prefer bigger models, but I was shocked at how well this was handling crazy high loads. And that paired with how quiet these things actually are, I would even say that you can pair this with a newer generation Core 9, uh, I wanted to say i9, Core 9, yeah times have changed, or R9 and not get a jet engine experience. And I don't think there is another 240mm AIO around where I could say that. But the best part for me is still pricing. Depending on the caller and RG fusion power, the 240mm AIO goes for between 60 and 70 euros on Arctic's own website, which is like the best price around. It's about 15 bucks less than the Oasis and it beats it once the load is high enough. So. Yeah, there's that. So yeah, from my side, absolute recommendation. Usually I would say go for a 280 because it's just marginally bigger, if your case allows it, of course. It's just marginally bigger, but you get more performance. But in this case, 240 is just fine. Even for higher end chips, this will do just fine. But okay, this should be everything for the Liquid Freezer 3 and 240. And at this point, a huge thank you to Arctic for sending this beast of an AIO over. Oh, and sorry that it took like half a year to release the video. I, I just wanted to be sure to figure out what is going on with my 420 before I release anything. And I figured it out. It was broken. Great. Oh, on a side note, we have a Discord server, so if you want to join, the link is down below. And we got channel membership, so if you are planning to sell your soul for an RG poop emoji, that's one way to go. But if not, I'm also releasing the content to all members two or three weeks in advance. Except for the NDA stuff, because, you know, I, I don't want to get sued. Additionally, you can rest assured that the income will not only keep the channel afloat, but it will also serve to build a little grave for my old 420. I may not know what Arctic did to it, but it does deserve a little resting spot. Anyway, thank you for watching, and if you want to keep on going, have a look at our take on the Oasis 240. Maybe the fusion reactor design isn't the thing for you, but you don't want to compromise on performance on a lot, so there's the Oasis. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.